we're going to pray real quick. You know, I, I want us to pray. I want us to pray over people that, like Joseph's not here tonight. He was sick, migraines, headaches. Uh, Kathy had an attack against her. She went to pray for somebody in the hospital there, and she saw some conditions in her shoulders, and the devil was trying to tell her it's cancer and all this stuff. And You know, we live in a violent time right now. There's an insurgence of evil. There's an insurgence of every... If you really want to look out there, it's worse than it's ever been before. But really not. It's the same. Satan has always been ugly, nasty, violent, contemptible. He ain't never changed. We don't have to feed Christians to the lions out here in our empathy at the Astrodome. You know, we, we're not having sport out of people being bloodied up and all that. So in other words, we're not yet as bad as it used to be. But it is bad for our time, for our generation. And so I want us to pray. I want us to pray over the spirit that, that confuses people about where they're supposed to be on Wednesday night. Was that good worship tonight? They, they're going to be packed. The voices are going to be, it'll be echoing out of here. That building down there will say, what are they doing down that little hole? But we've got to pray that in. It's not going to happen by complaining about it. It's going to, it's, I've said, God, enough is enough. I want to see salvation wrought in this place where men and women are going to just get out of selfishness and say, I want to be in the house of God. We don't need to wait till the tyranny hits us and all hell's breaking us and you've got to sneak to get to church so you don't get thrown in jail. It's heading this way, folks. The end time harvest is right now upon us. And we've got to be busy about our Father's business. And that means gathering together. And for, you know, look, when we all come together, I like to see everybody. I enjoyed Jeff with me when yesterday we went to Houston and uh, we went to shop and saw that friend of mine and he got to meet a new friend. Now he's 75 years old, he's a wonderful man, and he, he may say he's going to go duck hunting with him sometime. And they were really, the communion was great. And you know, that's what fellowship with the body of Christ does. Then all of a sudden you realize, I had church yesterday at Black Eyed Peas. It's pretty good too, I like Black Eyed Peas. But when you start realizing that God has something to do with us and he wants us to always be interlinking and moving out and touching other believers, not where they go to church, but why they go to church. It's not that my pastor is greater than that pastor. It's that we are about our father's business, growing up where we're at, going out, doing what we're doing, and that's all we should be concerned about. Not, well, what are they doing over there? Or what are they doing over here? It doesn't matter. What are we doing with our life? Are we measuring up to that standard that God wants us to have? So let's pray for the church. Heavenly Father, I just come to you right now in Jesus' name. I thank you for Celebration House. I call it out of my mouth, a place where God lives because the believers are here. They brought him with them tonight. And Father, I just want every person that's in this church to realize that Wednesday night is not the time to stay home and watch as the stomach turns. God, I thank you right now. It's not a time to sit back and say, well, I just had a little sniffle. Well, come get healed. Father said, come to the house of God and get hands laid on you and be healed. God, let us get back to biblical standards and live them before you. Father, I thank you right now for a breaking down of strongholds that have kept people away from being obedient to you. If it's a hindrance, God, I pray for removal. And God, I pray for their release. I thank you, God, that they're getting up every day thinking this is the day the Lord has made. And they're going to rejoice and be glad in it. And they're going to say, God, what greater joy than to bring new people to the house of God. Father God, I just thank you right now for it. I thank you for healing. I thank you for deliverance. I thank you for faith. I thank you for strength. I thank you that everything, Lord God, that we teach here is going to bring life abundant to those who obey and listen. Thank you, Father God, for the release tonight into everyone that's not here. And, Father God, I thank you for those that are here. Thank you for what you're going to teach us tonight. In Jesus' name, and we all said, Amen. And we all said, Amen. Oh, I like to get a little loud. I mean, you know, praise God. It's so much fun. You know, tonight we're going to deal with a, an issue that is something that happens in every one of our lives. That every one of us, when we go through life, we want to be accepted. Amen? I don't think there's anybody that says, oh, I get up today, I want someone to put me down. I want somebody to run over me. No. We all want to avoid rejection. Everybody say rejection. See, rejection is the result of a root. And we got to see that the one who taught us the most about rejection was Jesus. Isaiah 53.3. The Messianic uh, prophet, Isaiah. 
He was telling us what we would look and notice and recognize the Messiah by. He said, this is what he'd say. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. See, Jesus was despised and rejected. What, what we got to understand is we hear all the flowery and wonderful things that are told about our Savior, our King, and we get all excited about it. But Jesus never said to get excited over about him as much as he said to get excited over you being punished because of him. He said, count it joy when you're tempted. He said, rejoice when they put you down and hate you and throw you in jail for my name's sake. Hallelujah, God. Are you getting that? Hell no, I don't want that. What are you talking about? I don't want to be rejected. I don't want to go to school and be hurt. I, need I want the good stuff. He said, that's where you're blind. You don't know what the good stuff is. The good stuff is your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The good stuff that you belong to him. The good stuff is that when they put you down, they're not putting you down. They're putting him down. Guess what that means? He's inside you. Jesus is inside you, and the way you know he's there is because they hate you. They reject you. People look down on you. They don't want nothing to do with you. I had a brother told me he was sharing Jesus down at the workplace, and, uh, and they told him, uh, we're going to write you up, man. Don't do that anymore. We don't want that Jesus stuff on here. Today, I don't know what the final outcome was, but they were voting in, in the, in the uh, Supreme Court on a case that's brought over there about rejecting prayer before any governmental place. So if we start the city commissioner's meeting, and would you give the benediction? No, you can't do that no more. It's against the law. You cannot pray. You want to go to the bathroom, you go in there and pray. But you're not going to pray in here in front of the rest of the people. We have gotten down, reduced down, because why? God said, I said that you would be rejected for my name's sake. So it's going to happen, folks. It's not going to be always, woo, 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 great. See, if we look at rejection, it's how your perception is affected by it. If I understand why I'm being rejected, then I don't take it personal. It's not me they're rejecting, it's Jesus. See, there's a root of rejection, and it has its results. Rejection, the definition, is to refuse, throw away as having no value, not to use or notice. The roots are, 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 the, roots are the starting point, the first growth from the seed. You know, seeds are buried in the ground, they germinate. The roots develop and go down before the fruit and branches are seen above the ground. Do you know when you plant that little seed, the first thing that starts coming out of it is roots? Roots start coming out and going searching for nourishment, searching for water, searching what it's going to need. So the little river going up is going to have some stamina to it. It's going to have some nutrition to it. It's going to be able to survive. Amen? So, so realize this then. If you have rotten fruit, you have rotten roots. You can see trees, and some trees don't have nothing on them. Because the roots are decayed underground. They went into rock, they went into something, and they didn't get nourishment, and it was the branches were not being able to support it by the, the, the nourishment that had come through the roots. So there was rotten fruit. It, meant it did not get enough to fulfill the product. See, it's the process that takes time to get uprooted, replanted, rooted again in good soil, and then it bears good fruit. Sometimes you've got to move a plant and put it in different places. It's dying sitting there, so you put it where there's more light. You have to move it around. But once you get it in the right conditions, it starts bearing much fruit. See, sometimes you ask yourself, are you dealing with roots or are you dealing with fruits? I had a guy come from Ireland one time. He said he was really depressed. He was over there for a year or two, hadn't done much of nothing. Didn't seem like nothing was working. He was beating his brains out trying to touch people. And all of a sudden, man, he was just so down. He's just about to move back to the States. And he was out in the field in wintertime. You ever been out in the forest in the wintertime? There's no life on the trees. They're just all stripped, barren, dead. But they're not. The life on the top has been transferred to the life on the bottom. 
it's when the, when the season changes, now the root systems are being worked on. When there's no fruit bearing, when it's not the autumn or spring, it's now roots are going. They're going everywhere trying to find fresh supply. And he said, the Holy Ghost showed him, he said, this is what you're looking at. You think nothing's going on because you're looking with your natural eye. But every time you're planting seed, every time you're talking to somebody about Jesus, every time you're reaching out, your root system is getting stronger. So you should then expect to harvest because you've been sowing when it looked like nothing. Isn't that good? Luke 10, 16. He said, he that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despises you, despises me. And he that despises me, despises him that sent me. Wow. See, Jesus said, when they reject you, they're rejecting him. Sometimes it's that lack of knowledge that we don't understand when you're at your most opposition time in your life that something's just pounding you. It's because you're doing something right, not because you're basically doing something wrong. To change, it means just that, to change. Sometimes we want change to hurry up and get here, but it takes a while. Change isn't change until it's changed. Can you say amen? amen? Deuteronomy 29, 18. Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations. Lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. Here he's telling Israel, beware of poisonous roots. You know, when you think, well, I'm offended at someone, I'm going to pull up ship and go somewhere else, your root system is still messed up, and you go out and replant somewhere else, it'll only draw like a magnet those kind of problems towards you. Because Satan understands the flesh and how it works. And you get offended and you run from it instead of dealing with it and get it fixed, you're just going to go and get other offended people to draw around you. And pretty soon, you got the church of the unhappy. I'm just sick and tired of people. They just use you. They don't care about it. And how do they get back to self-centered instead of God-centered? The roots weren't dealt with. We didn't see God want us to plant ourselves and that he would cause us to grow and develop. See, we either respond to rejection with forgiveness and the decision to press on. It's, it's challenging to tell someone that just insulted you or someone that uh, tried to re rip you off or make you feel bad, hey, maybe I need to look at myself a little bit different. Maybe I am what's wrong there. I I'll pray about that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Do we ever feel like I want to say that? No. I'm saying, well, well, what are you, so who made you God? What are you judging me for? You think you And those words mean I got offended. I listened, and I didn't like what I heard, and now my defense mechanisms are getting up, and I'm going to protect myself, defend myself. And God said, why do I send you an opportunity to grow, and you miss it? Till you pass the test, you're going to play it again and again and again. Sometimes I just got to say, I see what's going on here, God. I'm not seeing through the flesh. I'm seeing through the spirit. You're giving me an opportunity to act like Jesus. But you have that sin cast the first stone. What do you mean? Was your perfect stone? Did you know that in the law, whenever someone committed a sin like that, it was taken by the witnesses towards the council? That means I saw her. I saw her banging that guy and her husband was at work. I saw it. Witnesses. Did you know the witnesses? It has to be two or three witnesses. So the witnesses come back, but guess who throws the first stone at them? The witness. 
The witness backs up what they said by taking the stone and smashing them. Then everybody else tripped in and they killed them. That meant your testimony against that person took their life. And you throw the first stone that you're in agreement. That's why when they killed uh, uh, Paul, I mean Saul, Tarkin, when they killed uh, Stephen, the prophet, it said they took off their cloaks and they piled them at his feet, which is symbolic in Israel to say, we did this because of you and the law. You are why we did it. His blood is on your hands that we killed. We're, we're absolved from it because we're obedient to the church. We're obedient to be those servants that executed judgment. So it's a big thing when you go judging someone. Because when you do, you're the one that's held accountable for the judgment. See, there's scriptures that refer to roots. Matthew 13, 6. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. Many times people get into the word, but because they have no root in themselves, they're quickly offended, and they turn away from God. Jesus was talking about the parable of the sower, and he was talking about the soils. And he said, this is why they don't produce. There's only one out of three soils that produced. Only one. The rest of them got deprived because of offense, because of something that took and distracted them. We saw that Satan stole the first seed. Then he came after the next one, got them offended and angry because they, they had to work, but they didn't have any root in themselves, and so they lasted for a while. Then when they got put down or rejected because of the work, they, they kicked it off. And then there's the one that he said, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust thereof, chokes up the word, and the word becomes a problem. Do you know that the Bible, this is you, this is you. But because of distractions, we never grow up. I, I, I sit down and think, God, why didn't you start me off? He said, I did. I started you at 12. But you took off running. You listened to the other guy. But you know what? I didn't leave you out. I stayed with you until you were 30 years old and you came back to me. Now I've been, I'm 64, so I've been 34 years going at it with him. I wish to God I'd have had that first 30 on top of that second 30. Bam! I'd have been way out of here. But you know, we're all that way. Roots always supply. That's where nourishment comes from. And when you don't have any root in yourself, what he's saying, you don't have any depth in you. You don't have enough to make the tree strong. You don't have enough to make the tree good. God said, the more you know of me, the more you walk like me, the more you act like me, the more your fruit will come out just like me. People should know you're of God, not because you tell them you are. They ought to know the way you live. I can see Kathy's full of God. Every time she shows up, nobody told her to, and she brings us food to eat. Well, you know what that is? That is a fruit of her knowledge of what God's given her, and she uses it to benefit others. Never asks for any appreciation for it. Never asks for any money for it. But she does it out of the goodness of her heart, which means the tree is a good tree. People will be drawn to a good tree. Can I get an amen? When you look at a tree and it's all rotten fruit, nobody wants to go there. But when they see a tree that's full of good fruit, every time I go back to Debbie's, man, I get them big old grapefruits out there on their tree. And every time I go by, I'm looking at them. Well, they're not yet ripe, but I got my eye on I know they're still there. So when they're ripe, I'm dead. Here's your box. I said, oh, thank you so much. Oh, those are so good. See, because they had no root, they dried up. That means I've got to make sure that I've got that tap root that's going inside there and bringing me what I need. Romans 11, 16. For if the first fruit be holy... The lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. See, you must make sure that the root is holy. That the root that you have is the throne of God. Our root goes into Christ himself, seated at the right hand of the Father. And, and that nourishment comes from Christ through the Holy Spirit, through that, that, that branch, 
into the vine, which is us. And that's where the fruit is at. When you see that branch breaking out with fruit, it's because of the nourishment that came from God that gave the provision through your branch to give to other people. It's the way that people know that there's a God. Not because there's buildings with steeples on it, but because there are people that are indebted to God, love God, serve God, walk with God, and they know his root. He is the root. He is the source of everything good. Ephesians 3.17 He said that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love. See, in the Amplified it says, may you be rooted deep in love and founded securely on love. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else would work, love lifted me. See, my heart is tied in to the root of God which is love. Anything that comes from God comes from love. It doesn't come from lust. It doesn't come from selfishness. It comes from denial. It becomes from a release that I do not serve myself. I serve God. I do it out of my heart because my heart is seated in Christ. And therefore, his anointing is running through my life to affect somebody else. You're going to get ticked off people. going to put you down. going to say bad things about you. I don't care how much you wish it didn't happen. It does. I had a great class of Bible that awesome class. It was powerful. I was so pumped. And then afterwards, somebody jumped on me because I hurt their feelings about something. I was going, what? 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 No, this ain't right. How come this? It's me. He goes, don't forget the fruit. Apply some of that fruit. If, it, if somebody's got a feeling about it towards you, just say, I'm so sorry. I really am. Give me time to work on it. I, I, I'll talk to the Lord about it. I, I, didn't, I don't want to offend anybody. I want to be kind, gentle-hearted, loving one another for Christ's sake. So I've got to get out of the way. Well, the way you get out of the way is learn you're in the way. Sometimes you think you're yeah, out, out of the way, but you're not. You're right smack dab in the way. I heard a woman one time, she said, I'm begging God to save my husband. I'm begging him, man. Every Sunday I'm doing the same thing. I'm yakety, 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 yakety. Finally, one day I just went in there and I said, God, I don't understand you. You told me. You told me you'd save him. I've been confessing it. I've been praying over it. And da, 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 da. he said, yeah. And every time I try to go in there and talk to him, all I see is the back of your head. You won't get out of the way and shut up. You gave him to me. Let me have it. Well, you know, I mean, God, I, 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 no, you don't have to shut up. Get away. So she did. She said, that's it. She'd get up in the morning. He'd be sitting there smoking a cigarette in the bed and drinking his coffee and reading a book. She'd get the kids up, get dressed, leave. Next Sunday, he gets up. What are you doing? Getting ready to go to church. The next Sunday, he's up. What are you doing? Going to church. Went to church and gave his heart to Jesus. Became a dead gum preacher. Why? Because we've got to trust God. He's going to fix it. He's going to take care of us. We are tapped into that root source, and the supply that we need is going to come down the pike to us to bless us and bless others. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ. You know what y'all do? Every time you see us, y'all put your name there. Who shall separate James Benson from the love of Christ? Who will separate Jeff Coco from the love of Christ? Who will separate Joan Smith from the love of Christ? Who will separate Steve and Kathy from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now, he was quoting David there. But listen to what Paul came back with. No! 
Uh -uh. In all these things we are more than conquered through him who loved us. For I, James Benson, am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And do you realize if we would settle down sometimes and just recognize who we are and who we're in, that he's going to be that, that vine that's coming down into our branch and he's given us all the nourishment and all the help and all the provision and all the care and all the things that this world will not ever give us. But we've got to understand, if I don't like the fruit, I need to check out the root. Can I get an amen? See, the results of rejection are this. Number one, insecurity. Insecurity is a psychological disturbance of epidemic proportion. Have you ever met someone like that? They are so freaked out that even the freaks won't get around them. I mean, it's a freaky thing when all of a sudden that person says, you are going, oh my God, whoa, time out. No time out, don't lose my time. I'm going to kill myself. And you go, what are you doing? You were having a major breakdown. And the reason is not because of the circumstances you're going to. It's because your lifeline has been severed. Your root has been detached from the supply. You can get back, look down that pipe and say, Oh, God, forgive me for that sin in my life there. Oh, God, forgive me for that way I treated so-and-so. Oh, God, get that out of the way. And now let me hook back up so that the supply of the Holy Spirit can bring nourishment to my life. See, insecure, the definition for it, is unstable, uncertain, lacking confidence, unsure, shaky, unsound. See, we would identify those conditions inside someone. We could tell if they're a dry and parched land, that they do not have the root system hooked up, and they're not getting the supply they need. You know, if a baby needs water, the doctor says it's dehydrated. It needs to be hydrated. Well, my God, you mean just give us some bottled water and the baby gets all cleaned up? Okay, wow, it's a miracle. No, it's a piece of information that was missing. You've got to give kids water. You can't just give them Coke and give them other stuff. You've got to give them water. It's the same thing with us. And without the water or the washing of the word of regeneration, we will not change our thinking mind. Can I get an amen? Insecurity is the fruit of the root of rejection. Listen, once you've been rejected, you've been distorted. You start looking at life through that hurt instead of looking at life through the truth. Isaiah 54, 17. I'll read it from the Amplified. He said, No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up against us shall be shown to be in the wrong. This peace, righteousness, security, triumph over opposition in our heritage as servants of the Lord. How many times do you, you know, how many times do we talk to each other and sometimes we act like we're not even saved? We talk about junk like it's got power. We act like, oh my God, you know what's going to happen to this and that. I said, I told my daughter today, uh uh, I don't care. I don't have Obamacare. I got Jesus care. I really, I was never told to follow this leader or that leader. I was told to follow Christ and that he would take care of us. He would lead and guide us into all truth. He would provide with us through the Holy Spirit. The power that put life together is living and dwelling in you and me. And yet sometimes we shake our heads and say, well, I don't understand. How go? Get back on the bottle. Start sucking that good word of God and let that milk of human kindness and love and, and all the things drive the abrasive force of confusion and distortion out because they're all lies, they're not truth. See, who is keeping you fixed? Is your money keeping you fixed? Is your retirement plan keeping you fixed? Is your doctor keeping you fixed? Is your insurance salesman keeping you fixed? 
Who is keeping you fixed? When you hook up and say, Jesus, this thing's telling me you lied. I can't trust you with my health. I can't trust you that you're the way. Well, God said, I can't help you there, sir. That's all the decision that you make. You make, who shall we put our faith in? Isaiah 53, 1 says, And whose report will we believe? And who is the strong arm of the Lord revealed to? Who's he revealed to? Who? I see one hand back here. It's revealed to us who believe. If you don't believe, you're scratching your head. Look, fear is emancipated because of a lack of faith. We are determined to live by what we see and not what he say. And when we start living by what he say, then we'll start seeing differently. Jesus offers security and unconditional love. Secure defined means having full command, to be strong, rule without anxiety, free from care. You know, I don't know how many times God's told me, why don't you use 1 Peter 5, 7? Well, Lord, that's, no, Lord, nothing. I gave you the weapons. Didn't you not say the weapons of your warfare were not carnal, but mighty through me, the pulling down those strongholds? Then how do you do that? You stop trying to figure out your cares. You cast them over on me. Lord, I'm going to cast that today. That's too big for me to handle. Oh, you're a wussy? What do you mean you can't handle it? I thought you went to Bible school. I thought you were a pastor. Uh, casting the whole of your cares upon Jesus because he cares for moi. I don't know about y'all, but he cares for moi, me, because I chose that. I chose to stand up and say, God, no matter what happens, let me be found in you, no matter what. Insecurity, we see that it has this development inside us to pull us down, to make us see other ways. But when we see security, then we follow it. Ephesians 1, 4. According as he has chosen... James Benson, in him before the foundation of the world, that he should be holy and without blame before God in love. Man, I wish y'all's name was written in there. I'm so glad mine was put in there. You see, according, when you see the word accord, accord, it means accord, hooked up with. When you see a threefold cord, it's not easily separated. Then you have to understand, in accordance to what he said, not in accordance to what I feel. I'm so tired of people with their feelings. Tell me how they feel. I don't care how you feel. What do you believe? He said, according as he has chosen us in him. Where are we at? When? No, no, no. Let's stay accurate. Thank you. Before the foundation of the world. Do you realize before we ever had sin in our life, we were in Christ? He knew us before the foundation of the world. He never, ever wanted to change his mind about who Adam was. Adam changed his mind who he was by who he listened to. You and I must go back to the root and solve that problem and regain the fruit. And the fruit was righteousness, peace, and joy of the Holy Ghost that was found by Christ and the blood that he shed so we can be empowered to overcome. Can I get an amen? You see, we've got to see this before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him and love. Do you realize you can go up here today and you could have fell flat on your face, made a big mistake in your life, and you can say, I'm sorry, and then you can rise up and say, Father, I thank you that I am holy and righteous. And someone say, yeah, you should have looked like it 20 minutes ago when you cut down old Jack Aruski over there. Yeah, but you didn't see between that time there I repented and asked God to forgive me. You didn't see that I went over and called him and said, I'm sorry I did that. And it doesn't matter if he just said to hell with you, I don't care or not. God said, you're forgiven, it's done, forget it, go on. According as he has chosen us. You know what he said? You've got to get in your head. I chose you. You didn't choose me. I ordained you before the foundation of the world. Quit telling me about what the world is trying to put on you. 
Why don't you put off what I say about you? Can I get an amen? We have to put on the garment of praise for the Spirit of heaven. We've got to put on the mind of Christ. You've got to say about yourself, not what you see, but what he says. And all of a sudden, you learn how to pray. And you start seeing how to obey. And then you start learning to say. See, he chose us. He adopted us. John 3.18 3, He that believeth on him is not condemned. Who is he there? It's us. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There is no rejection in him. Insecurity, inferiority, rejection, all these horrible feelings are not found in Jesus. He took those. He was rejected of men. He took all the rejection of the world and he put it on himself and he took it down into hell and he buried it where it belonged. That's why he could offer the newness of life to us. I don't care what you were. I don't care what your family was. I don't care where you came from. I don't care what you've done. I care about you. 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 You are what's important. You are what matters to me, God. Not for you to just serve me and think that now you're getting paid for me for doing good for me. No. You accept that you're accepted, that you're loved, that you're blessed, that you're victorious, that you're overcoming, that God is for you and not against you. Can I get an amen? Psalm 2710. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. The Lord adopts us. There are children that have been cast out. There's been children who raised, didn't even know who their parent was. I remember a, a great man of God uh, that had this called, uh, he had a children's ministry out in New York, Bill Wilson. And that man, his wife, his mother, 10 years old, set him out on the curb. Said, look, stay right here, I'll be back. Three days later, she still didn't come back. He's sitting there in the rain. A man drove by and saw him every day. He stopped with his son, come here. What are you doing? I'm waiting for my mom. She never came back. Get in the car. He took him home and adopted him. He sent him to, to, Bible, to uh, children's, uh, what do they call it, in the summer when you go to summer camp. He sent him up to a Bible summer camp. He got there. He met Jesus. And he said, oh, my God, I now have a father. I know the truth. And he grew up. His whole mission in life was to go rescue children. And now he has an international outreach all over the world. Because why? He got a vision of children that were like himself that needed what he got. And he never stopped. And he's still going. Because why? He found out he was adopted, that he belonged to Christ. There's causes of rejection. An unwanted conception. I know how difficult that can be when a child doesn't know that its parents love them. My granddaughter doesn't know her, never met her dad. But we, t I tell her, you look at me in the face, you got a daddy, it's right here, it's called Papa. You've never lacked if I can have anything to do about it. You just keep your focus on the truth, honey. Doesn't matter how you started. It all matters how you wind up. Every one of us have had Rocky Road startups. But thank God he could interrupt that and bring truth. Contemplated or attempted abortions. There are young girls that have been molest molested, not by the man who got them pregnant, but molested by a fiendish doctor's society that would have them abort a baby. Say it's, it's an unwanted pregnancy. Might be unwanted, but it's not unloved. God loved it, and God wants that child born. Wrong sex, wish for a girl, got a boy. 
There are many persons said, I met a girl in Mexico, and I'm no, in Honduras, wealthy, affluent family. And she was going to go give her life back to an old high school lover that she had. He was married with three kids, left her, married someone else, and was going to just write it off and say, you know what, I missed it. I really loved you. I missed it. So I want to file for divorce on her and, and marry you. I looked at her and said, honey, that's a devil. That's a snake crawling out from under a rock. That man you knew, he's dead. You're going to wipe those three kids out and that wife because of him? What, how long is he going to be with you and how many kids is he going to give you? Someone said, oh, I didn't love you either. And go find, What comes around goes around. I said, that's a devil. I said, you know what? The Holy Ghost told me. He said, that's all about your father. Your father didn't love you. She just broke down weeping and crying. Said, my dad, said, my mama said, when I was born, he walked in the room and saw it was a girl. He never looked at me again. Because in their culture, you got a woman, a girl. It's going to cost you. She's going to change the name and become that guy and raise up his children. Selfish, self-centered thing. I said, honey, you got to forgive your dad. She said, he never touched me. He's never hugged me or kissed me. But he'd give me anything I want. Cars, money. She was driving a gold Mercedes. Had everything she wanted. They were rich, rich, fluent people. But she was starved. I sat there and got her to repent. Showed her the truth about it. That she didn't love herself. Because she thought she was worthless. I said, you don't see the value inside you that Jesus Christ put inside you. Because he saved you. My God, he says, I threw all your sin as well as he says, the rest I'll never remember again. I don't care what anybody thinks of you. What does God think of you? She completely saw it, got repented, got filled with the Holy Ghost. Boom, way went out there, and she was a new woman. Why? Because we've got to get the truth out there that people will understand deception comes as a, as a half-truth. Oh, I knew him from the past, but you don't know him now. What are you going to think about those kids? The crime their dad is gone. Look past your feelings. Look at what God said. A child was born with defects, learning or physical. Ah, uh, that's that one. Let mama take care of it. I ain't got time for it. Just That's a horrible thing that that child has to overcome, that they're slow or they're not as mature or they're not as strong as somebody else in the family. Adoption or abandonment, the death of a parent. That's a terrible thing. Sometimes young kids have lost a, a dad or mama real early in life, and they are totally torn. They don't know what to do. Divorce. All of a sudden, two parents are ripped apart, and they go different directions, and they don't know what to do. The kids say, what does this mean? I don't understand. And so they get cornered and snared by all the depravity because of not having the right understanding of what's going on. Abuse, physical, verbal, sexual, emotional, withholding love. Many times that people have been so stressed out in their life, they say, shut up, get away from me. Go play with your video game. They will not give of themselves to them because they're so stuck in their own miry clay. They're a victim of circumstances. A baby separated from a mother too early. Having to work outside the home. A lady told me the other day, was out there, she said, her daughter came up and said, hey, I'm my, one of my best girlfriends, she's pregnant. And her mother just asked her, well, what's that mean to you? She said, it's horrible. She's miserable. She's got to carry this baby and have it. She don't want it. She's wanting to go play with the rest of her friends. They're all going out partying and playing, and she can't go because she's pregnant. You see, that can cause you to be a victim inside yourself and get all bound up inside yourself because you're, it's not right. It's not fair. Well, nobody told you to go in there and get a back seat that car with that guy. You didn't think about what you were doing. You thought about what you'd feel. And now you have to see what's real. Turmoil within the home that causes the child to live in turbulence or be ignored. There are so many children that live in fright and terror and they're always biting their fingernails because they're afraid of what's going to happen when they go home. There's so much violence going on around them. They're just beaten down. And they'll make wrong choices because they don't think, well, if my parents are like that, what's God really like? I hear them go to church and go, praise the Lord, brother. And then I hear them come up, ah, ah, ah. And children go, I don't, I don't understand this. They talk God out of their mouth, they look good, and then they get in there going crazy. Hmm, that's interesting. 
Peer rejection. Children can be very cruel. Hey, fatso. I tell my other grandmother, don't you ever, don't ever get your value from other people's opinion. You want an answer who you are? Come talk to me or Nano. You remember, we don't lie. Sometimes. <clears throat> no. We tell the truth to her. Marriage rejection, unfaithfulness, divorce. It's hard to tell someone that's been hurt or battered or abused over a relationship that they made the wrong choice, that they didn't really think about what they were doing. They just think that was, everybody does it. You have sex, you get married, you have babies. Not always in that order, but, and all of a sudden they wonder why things are all messed up because they don't have a value system in place. Negative conditions around you a rejection-based parents, the bloodline curses. You're just like your Uncle Smith. And he's a jerk, and he always will be a jerk. Why? Because he molested her when she was a child. But she, she can't say that, so she just calls him a jerk. There's so much hidden junk, and kids are not understanding. Even us as adults don't understand. A person seems so wonderful and nice here, but then when they get out of here, they're an animal. That's why they say, Pastor, you don't know him. Uh, when he's here, he's one, but when he's at home, he's hell. Well, it's because they're playing the game. But when you surrender to the truth and you start saying, God, fix me, he will. No one hardly gets left out. This is Satan's biggest attack. Well, everybody likes Kathy, man. She cooks good and all that. And I guess you ain't got no use for God. You don't, they don't ever talk about you. They just talk about Kathy. See? All of a sudden, people get, hmm, well, hmm, I'm not going back there anymore. I don't, I don't have to show up. I don't have to cook. I don't. And all they are is just saying, I'm rejected. I want someone to recognize me. I want somebody to say I count. And we've got to get past that. We've got to grow up. Can I get an amen? Rebellion. This is rejection is almost always the root of rebellion. When you're rejected, you're rebelling from something that's imaginary, something that you think is real because you've experienced it. That doesn't mean it's real. It means that you imagined the wrong thing and you got in the wrong place and you got hurt. Now you've got to deal with that and you need God to help you go through it. Can I get an amen? See, people are intended for love and acceptance, not for misuse. Mistreatment can create inner anger which manifests in rebellion. I heard a guy say it. Overuse will always wind up in abuse. Oh, I'm so needed in this church. My God, what would it be if I wasn't here? And man, you do everything and everything and everything. The man the pastor says, okay, I'm going to let this person do anything I ask him to do. So therefore, I'm going to load them up. That's wrong. That person, you would destroy them. Because they love you and they want to serve God. They love God. But then you see that and take advantage of that. There's a place where sometimes you've got to say, no, my, my associate was off sick today. He said, I said, no problem. Thanks for calling. Thank you for calling. Let me pray for him. I prayed for him. It's not about, well, now, wait a minute. How are you going to build a church? See, see, his brain's got to be washed. It wants to find out what is insolvent and what is sovereign. It has nothing to do with that. It has to be the ones who are here tonight. You're getting blessed. Amen? You're here. You're getting it. The others didn't. You say, oh, man, you should have been there. Like, it was awesome. So we got to start looking at things through a different evaluation system. I was mad. I was finished being pushed around. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. It's time for the cow to eat the cabbage. It's time for the horse to meow. See? And all of a sudden what you're saying is what I've been hiding from everybody else is now going to be manifested. Pastor, I didn't know you were so mean. Where did that come from? Oh, there's a lot more where that come from. <laughs> I opened up the wrong door and I shouldn't have done it. But once you do it, you go, what the heck, I might as well just blow it. <laughs> I blowed it out, and then you blow it bad. There's something about learning to grow up in God it means you're going to start discovering things about yourself that aren't that good. Things in yourself that before you go judging the others that are mad at you, look in the mirror and go, now, Lord, I look beautiful. Why are they seeing something wrong with me? What's that over my eye there? No, no, what's that? Oh, oh, I got your attention. You're looking at you now. Now, let me, let me show you some things. But before you get that log out of their eye, I mean, that splinter out of their eye, 
Let me get that log out of you. In fact, it's a log jam. You got more than one log in that eye. <laughs> See, rebellion is a rejection. It's almost always the root of rebellion. People are intended for love and acceptance, not misuse. People weren't made to be bitter. Bitterness doesn't belong in us. It will kill you if you stay bitter. Self-pity. Self-pity is a form of idolatry. It's God. I'm perfect. Why doesn't everybody see that? You're pitying yourself. You're saying, I will not change God. I'm fine like I am. Change everybody else, God. Show me how to change everybody else. But I'm okay. You have to know, you're full of self-righteousness. You pity yourself when things don't go your way. That means you're more concerned about you than you are others. Escapism. Creating your own pleasant world through daydreaming. When you start fantasizing, you'll turn into a nightmare. Fantasy is not from God. You start fantasizing, well, if I had all that guy's money over there, well, if I did this, I'd be wonderful. Oh, Pastor, pray that I hit the lotto. If I hit the lotto, I will give half of it to the church. You want me to call you a liar an hour then? What do you mean a liar? Sir, how much did you make this week? Why don't you give me half of what you took home? Well, no, I don't do that. Then you think I'm going to believe you when you get that big old 27 million bucks, you're going to come over here and drop? You'll be out of here by and never see you again. Why? Because that thought inside you is deceptive. If you're not given what you make, you're not giving to God out of that. What makes you think when you get this big ship coming in, you're going to come dump the money? If people don't put $10 in the plate. You think when they're going to come in here and put $1.7 million in the plate? I don't think so. Why? Because it has to do with the heart. If their heart can't give a tithe, their heart can't get a big chunk of change. And go, oh, well, here, I'll give you 20000 I thought you said you got $27 million. Well, 20 grand, Pastor, that's all you need. You know, I don't want to get you into pride. Excuse me, who, who are you serving? Yourself? Okay. Mood-altering drugs. Whoo, alcohol. Judgmentalism. Workaholics. See, that's a form of escapism. I hated responsibility, so I jumped into ministry and ran from my family responsibilities. Well, I'm needed. My God, I'm helping build a big church. My God, I'm out here beating my brains out. I'm in the in living rooms, on porch, out there everywhere. I'm ministering all the time. Yes, no, I'm escaping from my responsibility to be a father and a, and a husband to my wife and telling that ministry to go back to the ditch it came from if, I, if it deprives my wife of my attention. See, God's not proud of you what you do. He's proud of you, period. And anybody that tries to get your performance to measure you up to a sad standard and say, now you're good, you're never good. Not because some other man said so. You're good because God said so. Can I get an amen? amen? See, drugs, alcohol, all these things, they lead us in a fantasy world. We start looking into our mind through that perception, and we go, oh, I like that world. Man, I like that guy. But he's a liar. That's a false guy. He's not the real dude. You wake up with the real dude. Guilt. Guilt is a horrible taskmaster. It will always pick you and say, no matter how much good you do, remember that back there. And God said, why would I remember that back there if he delivered me from it? He threw it away, but we'll still go pick it up and carry it. Inferiority, poor self-image. Poverty, due to poverty image. Do you know, as you think in your heart you'll become? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You can take it to the bank. There's fears of all types. Hopelessness, defensiveness. Everything he looked at it said, oh, God, if I just had this, it'd make me right. Being hard, hardness, distrust, disrespect, competition and jealousy. You know, competition is one of the worst things in the world. It's indulged in the church world today that we look at successes versus failures, and we call them failures. There are, I heard a, a great man of God stand up in front of 300 pastors. He said, look, you don't have to have a mega church to be obedient to God. And he said, I want to repent for what the devil has sown inside the men of God who are out here with 15 families and they're trying to work their life serving those people and living for the kingdom and they're ashamed of themselves and want to quit. 
They quit doing it because they're, they're embarrassing themselves that God's not pleased with them because they don't have a mega church. And God said, I never created competition. Jesus, that guy over there, he's out there preaching your name. He's not one of us. He said, hey, if he's for us, he's not against us, leave him alone. Why don't we have the mind of God to, hey, if they're over there doing it, don't say, oh, that dude over there, he's just in it for a paycheck. Excuse me, sir? Let's go back and look at your paycheck. Uh, oh, oh, don't tell me you don't get one, because you do. And it's way bigger than mine. So let's, let's just leave that thing and let God be God and let men be liars. Let's all just do the truth. Can I get an amen? See, our adjustments to rejection are many. 75% of the world leaders are abused and rejected based. The greatest man you see has got a deep hole that he came out of. And he fights and strives to get ahead of that and stay out of it, never go back. But it's still there. Perfectionism. You'll see that in a person that's, that's driven by perfection. They say, pick that one little piece of paper over there. I cannot preach that on it. The TV may see it, and people won't come to church because that paper over there. That's pitiful. That man needs to be laid down, laid hands on him, and cast that devil out of him. Because God didn't care about it. Jesus didn't even, I don't know when he took a bath. He was always out there in, in his robe, same robe. Probably smelled. Workaholics. Accomplished due to workaholic tendency. They start being proud of what they do but they're not looking at what they don't do. How rejection affects your perception. How do you see things? Rejected-based people perceive things as being rejection that are not. Someone didn't shake your hand. You're walking out. They turned someone else. The heck with them. I'm not coming back to this church. He didn't shake my hand. That's terrible, Kenny. I'm tired of the show. That's it. He don't appreciate me. What did he do? Just somebody said something. He turned around. People can make up in their mind what they want, but they're really satisfying their own self. They're not, they're not hurt because they, you did that. They're looking for an escape to leave. Con rejected people can't be confronted. And one of the dangerous things that you do when people, they're bound up, you can't confront them. All the sweetness and gentleness as you want to, you can't tell them because they are rejected and they're protected by their own insulation. So you can't bring a revelation to them because they don't want it. That's why when you go to something like that, you've got to have your insulators up. You've got to be kind and gentle. Now, if they puke on you, spit on you, you don't forget the purpose of the conversation is to try to help that person be persuaded to get out of their protection zone and get free. And if you don't have that interest, leave it alone. Get away from them, because you'll only hurt them. They're going to be driven farther in their rejection till they can actually feel like they're accepted. And they can stay plugged in enough till they belong, till they care. You know, some people come to this church and they say, I, I thank God for our church, Pastor. I, I, I don't know where I would go. If this church wasn't here, I wouldn't go anywhere. I had people that had been in this church. They hadn't gone to church in 37 years when I met them. And now they've never missed. They're here faithful as rain. They have a home. They have a family. They have a purpose. They have a reason to live. How could I mar that? How could I go, well, you're, you don't, you're this and that? No. You've got to start learning to love people where they're at because you're trying to take them where they're supposed to be. You've got to help them keep growing. Amen? Well, that's it for tonight. We're out of time. Praise God.